Good, and the recording is live so we can get started. Um, so again, the, the slides and materials uh, that we're gonna follow for those who, who potentially can't attend right now um, are on Indico um, at the link that I'm just copying again in the chat as well. So what we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is two parts. Um, the, the EIC software environment, um, essentially how and where um, and why to run with uh, the EIC single software stack and how to get access to all of the components of the software that we're, uh, we're using for EIC. Um, and then uh, the EIC, what we call EIC productivity environment or what I would refer to as that. Um, essentially how to interact with other collaborators in an effective way um, in, in a large community like EIC. For, for many of us, this may be the first time we're in a, in a, a, a 500 plus um, experiment or in a community of uh, of at least um, now 1200 people in the, the EIC user group. Um, so that brings with it a, a few differences in how we manage software. So let's start with the um, the first part, which is um, uh, this EIC software environment. So, so why do we have a standard EIC software um, environment? So it really comes from a, a few different reasons. Um, the pr primary one is really just practical nature. Um, in the EIC software stack, and we've gone through a decision process over the last um, two months, I guess, by now. Um, and before that, we've gone through a, an EIC statement of, of software principles um, process. So through that process, we've wanted to create a software stack that is that is modular, where there's many different parts that work together in um, in well-defined ways that allows us to uh, to change those modules out um, when there's newer options available. But it also means that if you want to install all of the EIC software, you're quickly looking at 20 to 30 packages, um, 20 to 30 different places that you have to install, which might use different different assumptions on how the, the, the code is, is packaged. So it's, it's you know, in a couple of places you might do make install and in a couple of places you might do need to use CMake, some might use Maison, some might use um, even other build systems. So rather than forcing everyone to do that themselves, we're providing a, an environment where that's already done for you in a curated way where we know that the software that's installed that all those modules are working together and, and have been validated. This also allows um, you to run with this software on host laboratory systems, JLab, BNL, or other laboratories around the world, um, which rightfully, of course, focus on providing a stable environment rather than the most new and up-to-date software. Um, for EIC, however, we're trying to write software that is going to be used in 10 years, so we shouldn't start by focusing on the environments that are by now, and in many cases, uh, 5 to 10 years old already, um, on those host laboratory systems. So in particular, we require a modern compiler with support for um, C++ 17 or C++ 21, and in some cases, we're even looking at, at, at C++ standard 23. Um, uh, features. So if we require that, we have to make sure that everyone can, of course, access those kind of compilers. Some underlying dependencies are also um, are also important in in, in getting getting right. Um, so, for example, ACTS has a very rapid release cycle. DD for HEP has a rapid release cycle, um, and in many cases, the reason why they're releasing quickly is because they're responding to features that the EIC community has asked to put in. So again, uh, having a, a curated environment that we control rather than the, the laboratories that you're running at um, allows us to provide those newer versions rather than a you having to do it or the lab having to do it. So those are two um, advantages of the standard environment. So, so the first one was modularity. The next one is being able to have up-to-date software. The third one is that everyone runs the exact same environment. Um, it's the same environment that, it, that is not just used by all, um, all users. It's also the same environment that is used for um, full productions. It's the same environment that's used for running checks on the code in, um, in GitHub. It's used for um, benchmarks, detector, 
um, reconstruction and physics benchmarks, it's used wherever there's EIC code that is run. Um, so that means that you have access to that same code. And if you have an issue that you discover, it is easy, it, it is something that, that will be relevant because it will also affect the other, um, uh, other places where the code is used. Um, it's also something that will be reproduced by other people in those same environments. So that's of course why it's the EIC standard uh, environment. These standard environments are also versioned, can be retrieved later, can be potentially even rebuilt later. So if, for example, two years from now, you realize you want to make a, a, a particular plot again, um, then you can just go back to the, the um, version of the environment that you were using at the time and create uh, and, and be able to run with the exact same JN4 and, and root version, for example. Um, and then finally, the, the benefit, I, I hinted at it already a little bit earlier, but if you encounter an issue, a bug in um, the standard environment, it makes it easier for software developers to fix it if it's in that standard environment. Um, and making it easier for software developers to fix a bug is going to result in that bug being fixed quicker. Because if we cannot, we, and I speak as a software developer now, um, if we cannot reproduce the issue that you're seeing, um, that doesn't mean that your issue is invalid, um, but it does make it a bit of a fishing expedition for us to figure out what's actually going on. Um, so being able to reproduce um, a bug or, or an issue that you're seeing in the standard environment will help it, help it get fixed earlier. Now, are you required to use this EIC standard environment? No. You can, of course, do whatever you want, but we're hoping that we're saving you some time um, and making your life easier by providing this. Um, so it, it's in particular going to be useful for those of us who are new to scientific software um, and who don't want to spend um, a long time getting familiar with build systems and building everything themselves. You can still, in the EIC standard environment, do development with specific components that you're compiling yourself. Um, and we're going to go through that towards the end of today's tutorial with uh, the geometry for the EPIC collaboration experiment. In fact, most of the people in the, the software development group um, are probably using some mix of this standard environment that we're going to go over and, and other ways of installing software. So for example, uh, many of us may use root that's already available on the host system. So if you're, for example, logging in at, uh, uh, at a Jefferson app or BNL system, root is already installed. You can use the root that's installed already um, centrally to look at files that are produced in the standard environment. It's a very common approach. And in some cases, it's even probably uh, recommended. And I'll come back to that in the, in the case of Mac. Um, so you're not required to use this EIC standard environment. Um, but we'd still want to know if you feel that you can't, um, because it probably points to some workflow that we are not aware of and that we would like to support with this EIC standard environment. So, so please let us know if that's the case. Okay. So with that um, introduction, let's get started. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to start, you know, doing some of this, uh, this typing in my terminal window here, um, we're going to get started with getting this EIC standard environment. So um, as you've seen in the in the prerequisites for for the course there, um, there was the requirement that you have either um, Docker or singularity, um, or, or Aptainer as they're changing the name, um, if you that you have that available. So if you're on one of the, the host laboratory systems, and probably many of the DOE laboratory um, clusters, it, it might be as easy as typing module load singularity, um, but that, that is going to be one of the requirements for this, uh, this part. So in order to get um, an, uh, this uh, um, standard environment running, which we call EIC shell, um, we're gonna create a little directory. Uh, and I think I'm gonna create a directory that's just lowercase EIC. Um, I'm going to go into that directory and that's where I'm going to store um, all my uh, my stuff for, for creating this, uh, this standard environment. It's not going to be a whole lot of work. Um, 
So I encourage you to, to, to do the same. Um, you, you, can, uh, you can, of course, put this directory somewhere else. I'm just going to put it here in my home directory, EIC. And then I'm going to download a simple script to get us started um, and uh, run that script through, um, through the shell to install uh, the, the access to the EIC standard environment. So I'm going to use the curl command to download from the location https get e epic eic.org and I'm going to feed that into um, my bash shell. So what this is going to do, it's going to download the script that's that's uh, pointed to by this URL and it is going to feed it into the shell. And I think, so Jan Bernauer isn't here, but of course there's going to be a second approach to do this where you actually have a chance to look at what's in the script um, to verify that there's, there's nothing nefarious going on there, of course. We wouldn't want to do that. Um, and we're going to do that uh, in, in the next step here. So you'll see it downloads some things. It prints out some, some stuff. In particular, it tells me that it found Singularity. If you don't have Singularity installed, it might complain about not finding Singularity. Um, and then it installs um, the image that we will use for the container. Um, and ultimately end up, ends up with environment successful and you can start development environment by running this command dot slash EIC shell. So we're not going to do the running just yet. So um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to prevent, I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute or two. Um, but I do want to show that there's another way to do this. Um, and that is to just download the same URL into a file. Um, so I could do, for example, now with w, wget um, output document, um, and again, https slash uh, colon slash slash get epic eic.org. Um, and I'm actually forgetting the name of the file here. So this is going to write the content of this link into the file install.sh. And I can look at what's in that file. So in that file, you'll see this is a, a simple script. You could go through this um, to see what's going on there. Um, and I could run this script the same way. Essentially, it's going to do the same thing that I did before. Um, but I can run this script as well um, using bash in this way. Um, in particular, it um, it also allows me to, uh, to add some um, some additional options. So I could do, for example, bash install, and I can ask for help, which is going to tell me some other options that I might give to this uh, installation of the EIC shell environment. Um, most of those you won't necessarily need. It's supposed to pick out pretty good defaults. But in particular, if you're trying to change some of the directories um, or you're trying to pick a particular version of the environment, then this might be, uh, might be useful. Okay, um, so what does this script actually do? It figures out which operating system you're running. So we're supporting both Linux and Mac um, on Linux through uh, Singularity and on Mac through um, Docker. Uh, so it will figure out which one of the two applies here. So those are those were in the prerequisites and are, are things um, that you should have installed already. Um, it will also check, you'll see some references here to CVMFS. Um, it will check whether you have this CERN um, VMFS, I don't know what VM even stands for anymore. Um, so it, it will check whether you have access to that. That's a, a global file system that lives at the directory, top level directory CVMFS. And it has, for example, locations to um, Open Science Grid, which is where we actually store these, um, these containers. Um, uh, or store these uh, um, these environments. The benefit of using CVMFS, which you can install on any system, also on your uh, on your laptop, um, it uh, um, it will. It, the benefit of the CVMFS file system is that the the container and the environments that that you're using are going to update automatically every day. Um, they're they're actually updating six times a day. Um, so, so you'll always, by definition, be running 
the most recent EIC environment with, uh, with the CVMFS. Um, if you don't use CVMFS or you don't have CVMFS, then you have to take care of the updating yourself. And you'll see probably when you don't have CVMFS, it's also spending a little bit of time downloading this um, image the first, uh, the first time. So um, uh, you might be seeing that happening right now. For some of you who might be on, uh, um, on, on somewhat slower connections, i.e. not at one of the host labs, um, it might take maybe five minutes or so to download about two or three gigabytes of, uh, of, of uh, that container image. So let's take, um, take a little bit of a break now and, um, and I'm gonna give you an exercise which I'm gonna post in the chat. Um, it consists of, uh, of several steps. Um, so this is gonna be the first exercise to go through for all of you. Um, it's to install this EIC executable as I just went through using either of those two methods. Uh, and I'm leaving up my screen here, even though I guess most of it is already scrolled past. Um, and, and of course, all of this is in the, the notes on, uh, on Indico as well. Um, so install this EIC shell executable, look at the output and, and then check, for example, if it says something about CVMFS or whether if you know whether you have CVMFS installed. And then for advanced users, take a look at the installation options with um, this minus minus help. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you can, um, you know, I don't think you should need to use any of this right now, um, but that might be something to be aware of for the future. So I'll give you about, uh, you know, I'll, I'll check in when everyone's done with this because uh, we need to make sure um, that, that everyone is at least able to start this. And you should, of course, feel free to speak up when you have questions um, and, uh, or, and or post them in the chat like, uh, like some of you have been doing already. I still need a periodic coffee um, injection here uh, since it's relatively early still in the non-Eastern time zone here where I am at. Uder, you, did, yep. you referred to some notes, um, and all I'm seeing is kind of, uh, oh, it's there's the setup, and then it's it's after that on the notes where you are right now. Yeah, uh, so it's in um, so it's the Indico page, and I, I can actually, well, it's hard to share that that, that as another screen, um, but um, on that Indico page, you'll see there's a link to tutorial um, that should bring you to. Um, sort of a software carpentries like web page format um, and uh, um, uh, there, um, there, there's the introduction we're now in part two there the EIC software environment and you'll see that that goes through all of the, um, the steps. So um, Florian is pointing out an issue um, on, on the Jefferson lab iFarm yes um, so Jefferson lab as, as we all know and love blocks um, access to, uh, to, to outside URLs. Um, we've asked them to uh, unblock access to this URL uh, that is still pending. Um, I can post here the URL you can use instead um, in the chat, but it is of course a little bit uh, longer. So <laughs> I apologize for that, but that URL is not blocked from Jefferson Lab and uh, should at least work there. Um, but again, the idea is that uh, this will get unblocked at some point. So if, uh, if you're trying to use this at Jefferson Lab, the full command would then be, um, I'm going to type this in my window here, curl location, and then this full link to uh, Argon National Lab, um, and then feed that into the bash command. So try it with that. URL at Jefferson Lab or at uh, um, RC, RCAS, RCAS, you call it RCAS. Well, Robert, you may be covering this already later, but um, you can also just directly access through CVMFS and run the Singularity container without doing the download. 
um, which is another uh, way. To yes, go up there we're not. Go so, David, that that is that is possible, but that um, uh, that doesn't do a lot of the things that are necessary for this container to work. In particular, it doesn't set up the right bind paths for Jefferson Lab, which the the EIC shell um, uh, front end actually does. So. So if you're familiar with singularity and you know how to specify all those options, by all means, go ahead. But uh, for this tutorial, we're going to use this EIC shell front end. OK, glad to see it worked for Florian. Um, so just uh, with a thumbs up in the reactions on Zoom, um, if, if this uh, if if You've uh, met, uh, you've completed this exercise. Just give me a thumbs up. Then um, I know who is uh, who is kind of um, uh, completing the exercise already. And for some of you who were active in in the Athena collaboration, this might also not be entirely new. So. Okay, still uh, not as many thumbs up as I, I think we need to move forward. So um, if anyone is having difficulties, uh, please feel free to speak up or to, uh, um, to say so in the chat. Or on Mattermost, in fact, under the help test channel. Okay, so um, so let's move um, <clears throat> let's move forward um, with the the next step now. So now we have this EIC shell um, environment or this EIC shell command installed, and of course now the next step will be to to run that EIC shell um, command, and it's actually telling you how to start it just by typing dot slash EIC shell. Um, so I'm going to type dot slash EIC shell. Please ignore the two warnings that I have at the top here. Um, that shouldn't appear is uh, that shouldn't appear on your um, on your system, um, but uh, but that will occur here um, on, on mine. So th those shouldn't appear on yours. Um, but when we start EIC shell, you'll see you enter into a new environment as indicated by the different prompt. Um, so so now we're in a an environment that starts with uh, jog underscore xl um, with uh, which indicates that we're inside this uh, this new environment. Um, so so I'm seeing some more uh, some more questions in the chat. So Rutaparna, um, the the question the, the issue you're having is because um, because Docker does not appear to be installed on your system. I assume you have a Mac, um, so you will have to install Docker first. Um, and there's links in the prerequisites to this uh, to this tutorial that should point you to where to get Docker um, and uh, and install it. If I remember correctly, there's a link. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, can you paste the link again for the Docker to install the Docker? Um, so, I I think it's it's uh, let me quickly uh, find this here for you. Docker Mac uh, install Docker on a Mac is at this link in the chat right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Um. And then um, let's see. Um, so there is a way to run this without Singularity and just Docker, um, it, even on Linux systems. Um, but it will be limiting you in functionality. Um, in particular, it's also not something that is possible in um, in the, the 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 host laboratories or on DOE um, systems because Docker requires um, administrator privileges to run typically. Um, singularity gets around running uh, running with administrator privileges, and that's why it's used at some of those uh, those large computing sites. Um, so if you do want to run Docker, uh, I'm just going to um, I'm going to put uh, the, the 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 location of the image here. Um, it's ESC Web 
jug xl nightly. Um, so if, if you are familiar with Docker, um, you can use the location of that image in, in the chat. Uh, so that's where the Docker image gets pulled from um, and that gets updated every, well, it says nightly, but it's every six hours. So, uh, so I hope that helps you, uh, Josh, Joshua and, um, and Rachel. Um, okay. Or maybe Rachel had the, the same issue as uh, Sir Tuparna, but, um, okay. Back to our running of, um, EIC shell. So, um, so we've started the EIC shell. Now we now see a different prompt. So that indicates that we're inside the, um, inside the EIC shell environment. And I've referred to this already a number of times as a, as a container. Um, so the, what, what is a container actually? It's something that sits on top of the operating system of the host system that you're running this on, um, but that presents a different operating system. It's a container, which is different from a virtual machine in the sense that the container can only present a slightly different operating system. It can't turn um, a Windows system into a Linux system, or it can't run, you can't run a Linux container on, on a Windows system. You can only run essentially a Linux container on a Linux system or a, um, or, or on a Mac um, if you use Docker. But again, there's already an additional step you have to go through uh, that requires, uh, rec that requires Docker. So it's in some sense, a lightweight, um, it's a lightweight virtual machine, if you wish. Um, that also means that it it typically is not very useful to run your containers inside another virtual machine. I know some people might be running um, a virtual machine um, from the 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 Eche, um, uh, proposal preparation stage to get access to Singularity. Um, so that double step is is typically not as as performant because there's there's multiple levels of of operating system virtualization going on there that might harm your performance so that's something to keep in mind if you're in that situation um, and it might be useful to consider um, how you would be able to remove that virtual machine by having a direct access to singularity on on the host system uh, may i ask one thing so what what is uh, uh, like when i open some script, let's say for fun for all, I use singularity command to access the image. Is that the container or Docker? What is the difference between the two, the Docker and container? Why? So Docker and singularity are both programs that work with containers. Um, they work with the same containers. Um, the type of container is is, uh, is, is, a, is a standard compliant container with OCI standard open container initiative that can be read by both Docker and by Singularity. Typically people call it a Docker container, but it's not just Docker that reads those containers. So I hope okay. that explains it. Uh, Singularity is also Docker type or container something? Singularity. So Singularity can read containers, all containers that Docker can read as well. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So I've been sitting here now in this, this EIC shell, um, and I'm going to actually exit it. Since this is an environment, I can just exit it as I would exit the regular um, shell or login session. Um, just to show you that there's additional options that you can pass to this EIC shell command. Um, and, you know, again, with minus minus help, which is the typical um, help command, you'll see a couple of options to, for example, disable CVMFS um, checks or um, to upgrade to the latest version. Uh, don't do this now because you've just updated, uh, just downloaded um, a, a container already. But if you don't have CVMFS and you pass this upgrade option, it will download a newer version of the container um, or the latest version and uh, ensure that you're running with, uh, with a newer version. So if you do not have access to CVMFS, this would be the way to, I don't know, start your week or um, set this going on a Friday evening before you leave work um, so that by Monday morning you have an updated container. Um, or if you are really trying to play close on the development ball for uh, for the EIC software, then you could run this just every day and every morning. Um, so EIC shall upgrade will update your container under you, um, which is convenient. 
there are some ways in which you can run commands directly in EIC shell without even entering the shell with this double dash. So you can do things like dot slash EIC shell minus minus. And um, I'm trying to think of a command that would only exist inside the container or that would demonstrate that we're inside the container. So I'm just going to print the, the version of, of GCC. I don't know. Apparently GCC doesn't support minus minus version. Is it minus V? I forget. Um, so, but it, it calls some GCC command inside the container. That's, that's what happened there. Okay. Um, now I've, I've started this EIC shell now from this directory. Now we don't have to be in that directory. I can go to any directory. In particular, I can go to maybe a directory where I've stored some data um, and I can run EIC shell by specifying the full path to, uh, to that location where EIC shell is installed. So it's installed in my home directory, EIC slash EIC shell. So I can just run it like this, I'm back in that container. Um, I can even, and this is this is for uh, advanced users of, of Unix shell, um, I can set it up in my shell that I don't even have to specify this full path. I can just run it anywhere. Um, and that's how I have it set, set up so that any directory I'm in, if I just type EIC shell, um, it will start an EIC shell in that directory, which is, a convenience um, that might be useful. Uh, but the setup for that is, uh, is, is something that depends on your shell. So I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for you to, um, to consider afterwards. So we're, we're at a point where we can do another exercise here. Um, and, and that actually includes this, uh, this last part I just talked about. Oops, that's not what I wanna do. Where is it? There it is. So I'm copying the exercise in the chat again. So, so run this EIC shell script if you haven't already and exit. Um, look at these options. Um, look at this, uh, you know, the, the upgrade option and then think about whether you might um, want to update your, your shell environment to be able to run EIC shell from anywhere. And if that is something that, um, that you would know where to go for, uh, um, for how to do that for instructions or for help on how to do that. So when we're done with this exercise, we're actually gonna dive into this environment and look around and see what's all there. So since this was, um, this is essentially similar to what we've already done. If you're already done with, with this exercise, essentially just give me a thumbs up so I know um, that you're, uh, you're ready. So Florian, I see that uh, you have another issue there. Um, I really don't necessarily know why that's happening at Jefferson Lab that way. Um, I, I do sometimes, um, yeah, so, so uh, that, is, that is strange. It does seem like something is not set up correctly. Um, so I'll, I'll um, please post that as a, as, as a comment in matter most if you can. Um, so that's something that we can then uh, investigate and, and, and fix um, as soon as, uh, as possible. Because of course, this needs to be able to run um, at, at Jefferson Lab. Um, Jefferson Lab has some, as we already identified today, um, has some non-standard setups that make it sometimes a little bit harder to run things. I'm just surprised it has slash apps singularity because it I'd expected it to be um, slash apps slash bin slash singularity, but okay. So who's done with this? Uh, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, very good. I see lots of thumbs up, um, thumbs coming up. So um, 
let me uh, um, then go on to the next part, which is where we actually uh, explore what's inside this EIC shell um, environment. I'm just going to go back to this EIC directory, which um, you know contains this content. Um, and I'm going to start EIC shell here. I'm just going to do dot slash EIC shell because not all of you might have this set up to run without um, uh, without uh, um, the dot slash in front of it. So when we start EIC shell, um, if you're like me, you, you type a command and you immediately look at what is in the current directory after typing the command. So after running EIC shell, um, if I look at what's in the directory, I just see the same content as the directory I was in outside of the EIC shell environment. Um, this is actually a big benefit of, of Singularity and, and actually of Docker too, and the way it's set up on, um, on Mac, um, that uh, your directories, your home directories and, and directories like work disks or, um, or, or GPFS disks are actually presented to you inside the container just like they look at outside the container um, what is different inside the container are all the system directories so if we go to inside the container i have my jug excel prompt here if i go to the top level directory and i look at the at the contents of that directory this might look similar those directories might all look similar like a typical linux system but there's different content in there the content of the bin directory at the top level or the 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 what is it the user directory at the top level they are all specific to the container that's really where the the operating system in the container is stored um, and that's what is overlaid on top of the the file system that is uh, on the host system so this is where the container specific content lives while you can still access the content in your home directories that um, that also lives outside the container. This is, of course, an advantage, and this is actually where it, it uh, outperforms virtual machines a little bit in, in convenience of the workflow. Because in a virtual machine, if you close down the virtual machine, you can't necessarily access the files that you created inside the virtual machine. So this allows you to create files inside this EIC shell environment and then um, uh, and then use them outside of this EIC shell environment. Um, so I see a question from Kaylee. Um, if uh, if you don't have installed SH in that directory, that's fine. Um, so you used the step with curl where you avoided having to create that install direct, um, file. Um, I have that install file there because I, I did that second approach as well, where I downloaded this install script in an explicitly. Um, so if you don't have this installed at SH, that's perfectly fine. The important part is that this EIC shell um, uh, is is there. So, um, so there's a couple of directories here that we're going to look at in particular in this um, in the container operating system, and I'm going to go to user local. Um, as you may know. On, on Linux operating systems, user local is where you install software that didn't come from the package manager of the operating system. So if I look in that directory, user local, I see lots of little directories here. And, and if, if you're uh, familiar with some of the, the software projects in the, in the EIC, you'll see references to things that make sense for EIC context, like juggler and this dd detectors which refers to dd for help and if you look into the include directory um, you'll see even more of that you know anything that starts with a t is probably going to be root and there's some other stuff in here that might look familiar um, so this is where our um our uh, eic shell programs or eic programs really live inside this container they're inside this user local directory. Um, I can show that even more directly by, by just running one of those commands that is uh, available in, um, in the EIC shell environment that you might not have on your host system. For example, ddsim, um, I'm going to do this with minus minus help, um, it, uh, um, this, will, this is a, a, an entry point for running simulations 
with uh, DD for HEP based geometry. Um, so DD sim is not something you would likely have installed on the, the system that you're regularly using, but it is installed inside this container. So I can show that indeed when I run DD sim minus minus help, I get a lot of help on how to run DD sim. This might look a little bit differently for you in particular. I hope that uh, um, the layout is a little bit better than uh, in my zoomed in uh, shell terminal here, um, where it's all, of course, jumbled text. Um, but uh, but you should be able to access this DD sim um, command. And if you look at where this DD sim command is located with the which command, which DD sim am I actually using, you'll see that this lives indeed in this user local directory, which is where all of the EIC specific software is installed. Um, and you know, one of the, the things I'll point out to people who are developing software who might be here. Um, so that of course is one of the, the reasons why um, we, we like for software projects to have support for installing um, uh, for, for installing in this user local directory. Um, it, it must in some sense then adhere to, to the sort of standards that, uh, that software um, projects in Linux, Linux um, and, and using the, the file hierarchy standard um, are, uh, are expected to adhere to. So. Um, I can look at this uh, this executable, this DD sim, in a little bit more detail. I'll give uh, additional and long details on my ls command. And you'll see this is actually not an executable. It's a link to a different location. Um, and that brings us to another directory in this EIC shell environment that is going to be useful. And that's this opt directory. So if I go to the opt directory, which is where in some subdirectory of a subdirectory of a subdirectory, the CD sim really lives. Um, I can look at what's in the opt directory. That's also going to be specific to the singularity containers, to the, to the container environment, um, whether it's singularity or Docker. Um, this is where we store things like detector geometries. So the, the, um, the regularly updated geometry of the detector or even versioned versions that are older. Um, this includes things like magnetic field maps. This includes things like calibration files. Um, this includes a directory with software, which is where, for example, this DD4HEP is really installed. It also tells you which version of DD4HEP it is, which uh, GCC compiler it was compiled with, although there's an easier way to access that, which we'll, we'll get to later. Um, it has information about our large production campaigns. So this is what includes the, 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 um, the infrastructure that we've used in the past to run large production campaigns, even though that might change um, come uh, October. And it includes a full um, suite of benchmarks for detector benchmarks, reconstruction benchmarks, and, um, uh, and, and physics benchmarks that run all the way from just counting the number of hits that we expect in detectors to um, what is the, the resolution um, in our X reconstruction using various um, inclusive kinematics determinations? Um, okay, so I am looking at Brandon's um, error message there. So this is on a Mac with, um, with Docker and it appears to be looking for an EIC shell latest image, but it should be looking for, let's see, where is the Docker image that I've posted before? Um, it should be looking for Jug XL uh, nightly. So um, I wonder why um, that error is appearing. But again, if you have, if you continue to have issues with that, um, with running uh, this on, on a Mac, then please do post it in the, the matter most help desk um, for us to investigate further. Um, one other directory in this opt directory is this SPAC environment. Um, it's not quite important why this is called that way, um, but one thing you'll find in here is a single file, spac.yaml, and you can look into that file, and that actually includes, and it's unwritable, it's in the container, um, so you don't have access to the right access to the files that are 
not in your um, in your own directories, just like a regular system. But this includes the information about all the versions of software that are installed in the um, in the EIC environment. So so you can see, for example, it includes um, you know what's what's a piece. Well, it includes Jan 4, 11.0.2. Um, it includes, if I scroll down, root is going to be there. Um, so it includes root 6.26.06. So all of that is installed. There's some additional flags here that indicate which features we require for those particular programs. Um, but this is all the software that's installed inside the container. Another way to access that anywhere is by typing EIC info. Um, that will print even packages that were pulled in as dependencies of those packages. Um, this is going to be a much longer line. It includes a little bit more detailed information. Um, and I'm just going to leave that there. Um, it also includes at the end specific version information about components of the EIC software stack that are installed um, if they're not included above here. So it includes information about which epic geometry is included. And in this case, it's the main branch with this um, this particular commit tag. So again, allowing for uh, reproducibility and, and for archiving of, of what particularly went into this um, container. So what is the command for it? I missed it. That's EIC info. Um, so one thing that uh, you might want to use this for is, is or might um, combine this with is the grep command so if i'm interested to find out well which version of let's think of something which version of acts um was was included then i can just grab for the out for uh for acts in the output of eic info and yeah i get two hits here but uh one is uh, version 19.7.0 is what we're using inside this container so that's the version of acts that is installed there uh, there's an additional component that allows ACTS to talk to DD for help, um, which is at version 1.00. Um, you'll see this update fairly frequently, all these versions, because we're trying to, of course, maintain uh, a, a current system. Um, so, uh, so when there's changes, maybe once every month or so to some of these underlying packages, um, then you'll see those, those numbers change slightly. But normally, that's not something you should um, need to worry about, because most of those um, programs you're not interfacing with directly. Okay, so let's do another exercise here. Um, and I'm going to post this in the chat again. So use the, just navigate a little bit around in this, uh, in this EIC shell. Um, verify that you can indeed access the directories that you need for your work. Um, if you cannot, uh, in particular, if you're one of the, the the laboratory systems um, that may happen, um, please let us know. There's there's some there's some uh, structures that, uh, for example, Lustre-based file systems at JLab and BNL are are using that don't always get get mapped properly inside the containers. Um, we we think we have them all working right now, but uh, when when the the systems change underneath. Um, it, it sometimes causes some issues. So verify that you can access your data um, and things like that. Um, verify that you can uh, you can indeed run some software packages that you might want to check. So uh, so DD sim is only one. Um, you should also be able to run root. Um, so uh, so check that you can run root inside the container. It's not necessary to run root inside the container. If you're analyzing files, you might just want to run root in a in a separate um, a separate window outside of the EIC shell environment, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, but you should be able to run root inside the container. Um, I will point out, however, that on Macs, there's a couple more steps needed to be able to get the root T browser window to show up. Um, so so that, uh, that might not work. Um, and then, um, yeah, then the last advanced um, exercise here is, uh, is verify that uh, Indeed, those versions that we saw in DD Sim that that in, is indeed what what is inside this this specification file, this this YAML file, um, and that uh, those are also the ones you find under this opt software directory.
have one questions about here. Mm -hmm. uh, when I type dg sim minus minus l, which which executable from which scripts it in for which scripts it is printing the information from which script it prints the information. So so that's dd sim. So dd sim minus minus help will find the dd sim that's in this location, which you can get if you type which dd sim. So that's the location of this script. Um, now this is actually a link to this location. And that in turn is, let me see if it's even a script. It is actually a Python script. Um, so you could look at what's inside this Python script and you know, this is, this is what that script does. Um, it doesn't do a whole lot, apparently. It mainly does this um, and then runs that. Um, but I'm not going to spend that much time on that. But th that would be the process to, to figure out which, um, which file is actually being run when you type a command. Yeah, because I see in this particular, there's no help option there. I can see that's what, uh, from there it is taking that help skill. That, uh, can yeah, so that's it? done inside the, the, the Python. Um, uh, that's done inside the, the, the Python code. It's processing this help option. So. Oh, okay, thank you. And so, how, to how to grab, if I want to grab something without not going to, when I grab something, it prints so many things. Is there any locate option or something? Which so there's no, there's no locate inside the, the container because that would just increase it with, with more unnecessary files um, or, or depending on your point of view, at least. Um, so, so with grep, um, it's also solving, uh, ser serving a different purpose, but uh, try to be more specific in what you're grepping for. That would be, um, that would be the advice. Um, Charlotte asks what Mac user should do to get root T browser up. So the, the recommendation, I, I don't have a Mac, so I, I'm, I'm only, I'm only partially qualified to answer this. Um, but, what I, what I hear what most Mac users are doing is they're, they're going through the trouble of setting up the graphics connection once, and then they say, ah, this is too hard to do for T-browser every time, and then they just use a root session outside of the container. Um, I, I don't know how you install root outside of, of the container, or outside of Docker in, in a Mac environment, um, but I think, um, I mean, someone else might might be able to comment on that. Um, but there is a way to set up um, the graphics for um, Docker in in uh, under a Mac. I, I just I'm not familiar with it, so uh, um, maybe someone you can else just can download comment. root binaries for for Mac. And I think you're right; it's probably easiest just to run root outside of the container. Right. Yeah. Homebrew um, for root. One more thing, because you are designing container, so why we always don't, when we, let's say, when we go into a directory, why it doesn't show some directories like in the same line, as we see in the terminal? Is it the problem of the container? Is it not implemented or something? Did you get my point? So your prompt might look different, right? Is that what so, you mean? For example, if I go to, Jag Excel and then your name WD etc. If I go to a directory, it doesn't show that directory in the same line on the same same line as we see in the terminal. It doesn't show the whole path on the same line. Why it is like that? Um, that just uh, that's just how how you have set up your um your terminal your um your prompt. So th so that could look differently. Um, uh, that's just uh, a local setup. It it doesn't. The, the, the container doesn't change how you typically set up your your prompt so if you have it already set up differently it, it will look differently inside the con inside the container too um, we're trying with our um, with the container with the AC shell we're trying not to mess with your um, environment as much because some people might have legitimate reasons to change things around outside the container um, for use then inside the container as well um, so, so we're not modifying the environment from outside the container when you go inside the container. Again, 
Mac being slightly different because for Docker that just uh, it has a different approach. But for um, Singularity, where we're reusing your um, your shell environment, which is what I'm talking about here, environment variables and so on, um, we're, we're using the ones from outside the container unless the inside the container requires them to be different. So for example, root sys will be overwritten, um, but your your prompt configuration won't be overwritten. Um, there's yeah, there's a there's a few that we need to override for for um, reasons of of uh, of security, but uh, but that's all. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so we've been going for a, an hour now. Um, so I'm actually gonna uh, do a little bit of a break here, about um, about five minutes or so. Let's um, let, give everyone uh, a chance to to take a break. Um, go to the bathroom or whatever. Um, get more coffee in my case, um, and then we'll uh, we'll reconvene at uh, at at five past. And I'm gonna pause the recording. Um, okay, so welcome back to the second part of uh, of of this tutorial. Now, um, so what we're gonna do now, and in, in if there are any questions that came up for the first part, um, so so please feel free to ask them if you haven't uh, yet. Um, but uh, the plan for the second part is to go over some of the productivity environments. So how would you? Um, work with some of our github interfaces um, and then we'll bring it all together um, github with eic shell um, at the last part um, towards the end of the the tutorial so that you can see how to um, how to use git in um, an environment that uh, that also involves um, interaction with github inside eic shell so in order to do this i'm gonna github.com i'm gonna stop sharing and share a different window which is my web browser um if i pull it up here where is it um let's try that again there we go um and i'm gonna go to um, github.com slash eic that's going to be the starting point. I'm going to copy and paste this in the chat so you can just click it. Um, so that's going to be the starting point for our um, interactions with the the GitHub um, uh, with with uh, the the code repositories um, of uh, of EIC. Let me actually increase the font size a little bit so that's easier to see. 170 usually works well. Um, so this will be one of the, the the times when you'll also want to follow along with um, with a web browser. Um, so in this uh, um, in the EIC, what we're using for um, for software uh, development among lots of collaborators is is Git, and in particular GitHub as the the front end for that. That's our main code repository tool, um, and it allows us to work together. On, on these large software projects, on all of the different modules actually um, in our software stack. If you go to this github.com slash EIC URL, you'll see the front page of the EIC software um, uh, GitHub organization. Um, and this might look like this to you, or it might look a little bit different and it might look like this. It might look like it says, you know how to join if it looks like this where um, it has information on how to join um, it means a either you're not logged in to github with your github account or even if you are logged in you are not a member of the github eic organization so um there are many <laughs> i feel like a salesman but there are many benefits to being a member of the eic organization um, so we definitely encourage you to do so. Um, uh, the, the main benefit um, that you will you will get from uh, being a member of this uh, this organization, which is entirely free and is, is valid for life, um, life of the EIC, um, you uh, the benefit is that you'll be able to get um, right access to some of the repositories that you might be interested in. 
um, and write access to the repositories may also translate into being able to run full um, benchmark chains on, for example, the geometry, which are which are otherwise not possible. So some of our development workflows depend on that a little bit. Um, to become a member, uh, just send um, your your uh, GitHub username either to me in Mattermost. Please don't do it in the chat here because that will get lost at the end of at the end of the tutorial. Um, or send the 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 um, your your GitHub username to the EIC user group software working group conveners, so they'll be able to add you as well. Um, so that will be the way to get started and become a, a member of the EIC um, software um, organization on GitHub. I'm going to go back to the member view, which is what you should see if you're a member. Um, it has just some some convenient information here about uh, the regular meetings that we have with the EIC user group software working group and then the epic um, computing and simulation working groups with mailing lists and the wiki pages um, so this just to um, just visible to to those who are already members um, in addition to being regular members there's also teams inside the EIC organization that are um, that you can join um, if you go to this page at the top here um, you'll see teams. If you click on that, you'll see all of the teams, um, some of which you, you know, you might not be a member of, most of which you might not be a member of. Um, if you click under members and on my teams, um, you can uh, look at um, the list of teams that you're already a member of. I'm going to point out a couple of teams that are useful to consider becoming a member of. Um, well, I guess one of them in particular, um, and that is the one with the most members here. That's this Epic Devs um, team. So that is the, the team that you have to be in um, to be able to, uh, um, to get right access to, for example, the geometry repositories for the Epic collaboration, um, geometry for the, the IP6 um, interaction uh, regions and so on. Um, so becoming a member of this team after you're a member of the Yes, the organization is something you should be able to request by clicking on it and then um, clicking request uh, request membership or something like that. Uh, for, forget what it looks like if you're not actually a member of the of the team. Okay, so let's go back to this front page um, for the EIC organization. If we scroll down a little bit more or click on repositories here, we'll see several repositories listed in order of typically in order of most recent activity so you'll see most recently i see uh, chris dilks is probably very active right now or someone is very active in in editing right now three minutes ago the cdis repository um, we've got the eic reconstruction repository the epic geometry this tutorial um, and some other repositories that are being uh, um, uh, being filled. So as you can see, there's lots of activities. This is, uh, this is what, about 10 repositories that were all modified within the last day. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on. Now, if you're interested in one of those repositories, um, you can go in, for example, I'm going to pick the epic um, geometry description here. You can go in and subscribe or watch the repository. This will um, let you know of any activity in that repository. Um, that's helpful if you want to stay up to date um, on on some of the activity in that repository. For example, you can if if you just click watch here, and it should say watch if you're not already watching a repository. Um, you can um, watch everything, all activity, or you can customize this to, for example, only be notified when someone files new issues or when new features are are merged into. Um, or our new pull requests are at least submitted to merge new features into the to the, the, the geometry. Um, so I would encourage you to to use those watch buttons to uh, to keep track of some of the repositories that you're interested in. Of course, it, it might generate some emails, um, so so you can fine tune how much you actually want to um, want to find out about. Um, another thing next to this here is stars. Um, so you can also star repositories that you particularly like 
Um, I think there's a way to get to your starred repositories as sort of your favorites so that you can um, you can easily find them back in uh, in your GitHub interfaces. Um, but that's another another thing you could do. Um, finally, there's uh, forks. Um, so in the GitHub language or in the, the git language a fork is is when you take this entire repository and copy it over and essentially create your own version of it where you do your development and then that development gets contributed back to this upstream repository which is where um, the main development happens um, that is a, a workflow that we we try to support but that's one of the the things that um, uh, is a little bit more limited because um, as a member of the EIC organization with development going on inside a repository um, uh, that is part of the EIC organization, you'll be able to run full um, full checks and, and benchmarks, which would not be possible on a fork. Um, so, so that's a little bit technical um, and we'll come back to those uh, those benchmarks and checks later. So for now, I'm going to um, copy an exercise in the chat again. Um, so the exercise is, uh, let's see, this looks a little bit different, um, but anyway. Um, so I want you all to verify whether you're a member of the EIC organization. Do you see this members only page or do you see the, um, the, the page that has uh, uh, how to join? Um, Check which teams you're in, um, and if you're not in Epic Devs, then, then request that at the link that is in the chat. Um, and then take one repository to watch um, and, and subscribe to that repository with some level um, of activity. I'm going to give you about um, three, four minutes or so for that. Some of you may already be watching uh, um, the the um, activity on, on some repositories. So let me scroll up and copy that Mattermost invite link again. There we go. Um, so yeah, Sangbeck, the um, link to the Mattermost invite is, is up there. Ah, uh, but now you tricked me into posting that secret invite link during the recording after all. Hmm. So in this case, I don't really need to ask for thumbs up, but because I can see the number of people who are watching this epic repository go up. Um, but uh, when you're done with this this exercise, please give me a thumbs up so I uh, I know when when we can move on. Hello, Varka. Uh, yesterday you told me to create uh, my own repository instead of port. Where to find when I create that repository? Um, yeah. yeah, yesterday I think you created a, a branch on, on a fork, right? So, yeah. Okay.
Okay, so let's move on. Um, so the next uh, part I want to talk about is how to actually contribute to these repositories. And I'll, I'll use the EPIC geometry description um, as an example because it's, uh, you know, it's right here and it's something that, uh, that everyone might be interested in contributing to. Um, but of course, the same thing applies to many repositories, including the, the reconstruction repository, EIC Recon, um, the CDIS repository with some of the analysis um, approaches in, in CDIS EIC. Um, so, so please think of this as something that applies generally to all repositories and describes a general workflow of how we work collaboratively on GitHub. So what's the main thing we want to ensure when working on GitHub um, collaboratively? It's we want to avoid duplication of work. We don't want people to do something that someone else is already working on. We want everyone to always know, you know, who's working on what, who's working where, what's already available, um, and, and where are the gaps where no one's working on so that we can start working on that rather than working on something that someone else is already doing. Um, we don't have enough time to duplicate our efforts at this point. So how do we do that in an environment that's so distributed like this? I can't just walk over and say, ah, Charlotte, what are you working on in terms of geometry? I can't do that with everyone all the time, right? So we have to build it into our workflow. Um, so the way we start our workflow is by using issues to indicate what it is that we think is missing in a particular project. So again, I'm gonna use Epic here as the example. I'm going to file or show how to file an issue with something that you think should change in, the, um, in this code. And then we're going to turn that into something that turns into action, um, and then uh, we'll, we're going to show how to how to actually do some development based on that issue um, and uh, how to do that development in EIC shell. So if you look at uh, the issue tracker here, there's there's you know 19 open issues. There's some that are closed. There's um, some that you can see here that have been added recently. You know, mostly all around the same time of the last tutorial, um, and what this um, issue tracker allows us to do is identify what needs to get done. Um, so I'm going to look at, for example, this first one here. Um, it points out that there's an issue in um, grid phi eta that's not working as a segmentation in DD4 HEP. It doesn't necessarily matter what, what this means right now. Um, there's some information that uh, um, allows us to identify how to reproduce this, what is the actual um, issue, what's the, the expected results, but what are what is then observed. So, um, so there are some standard questions here that get asked in this um, and addressed in this issue. Um, if I in, file a new issue, that's exactly the kind of things that under a bug report would pop up as, a, as the questions to answer. So let me go through that a little bit more slowly. Because if I go to issues and I want to file a new issue. There's two different types here. There's a bug report, which is, if you notice something that doesn't work the way it should in the, the software project that you're looking at. And there's a feature request. That's if you think that something needs to be added to this, um, to this software geometry. There's also some additional links here that help you in getting in touch with the weekly meetings the, the, uh, or, or with the Mattermost channel. Um, this is not an invitation link, I guess, so it doesn't actually work if you're not a member already. But um, So let's go through the other one here, a feature request. This has slightly different questions. Um, it has a question, you know, what, what is the problem that you're trying, that you think should be solved? What is it you're trying to do that you can't do? Um, what is it that you think it should be doing instead? Um, are there other things, other alternatives that you think might be possible? Um, and is there any other things that you might want to add? Um, of course, you don't have to stick to these, these questions, but they're generally good questions because they answer the questions that the people who are going to be implementing um, this issue might ask you anyway. Um, so it's good to answer them right ahead of time. So this is, um, this is uh, one way of, uh, of, of passing this information along as an issue to the software developers. Um, in particular, this, let me go and um, pick one like this one here. Um, so, so Matt posted um, nine days ago 
that there's an issue. He, he, this was before the tutorial, so I'm trying to use an example that, to show that we also use this in our, in our daily interactions. Um, so he used this exact same prompts to, um, to answer um, what it is that he thinks should be, should be done for the MPGDs. And, and there's a little bit of detail. This is sort of this additional information, which has a screenshot of, of what's currently there. Um, and so that's out there now um, for, uh, as, as an indication that this is a potential thing that someone should work on. Um, it doesn't mean that, that anyone is going to, assign, going to work on this. It also doesn't mean that Matt is going to work on this. Um, there's no one assigned to this yet. If, if I were to click assign myself, then that would indicate that I'm now considering myself to be assigned to this work and that I'm actually going to be working on this. Um, there's also a possibility here to add, um, add comments. So it puts the entire discussion about this issue in a single place and you know that is accessible to everyone. So I could say, for example, at um, Sylvester, which, whose username is Sly2j, um, what do you think of this uh, proposal? Um, I wouldn't normally type the last part there. Um, so this will now notify Sylvester that, um, that there's this discussion going on here. Um, and he might then want to comment on this. And it's a way to pull in some people that you might want to uh, consider um, for this issue. Or in particular, maybe if you have an issue, it, it's a way to automatically um, notify someone who you think should be, uh, um, uh, should be looking into this. So that's the first step of our workflow is going to be filing an issue. The next step is then going to be turning that issue into a branch and a pull request on Git. Now, as an exercise, I want you to go and pick one repository. It might be the one that you decided you wanted to watch earlier. Um, and I want you to think of an issue with that repository or related to that repository um, that, that you would want to file. And I want you actually to go through and file that issue against that repository. It's at this point not as much of a, a an issue, no pun intended, um, if it is not, you know, if you're not 100% sure about whether it's relevant or not, but please file an issue that relates to something that you care about in that repository. Think of a good title to put in, so something short that summarizes it well. Um, open that issue and fill out the, the provide a template. If it's a bug report, pick the bug report. Um, if it's a, a feature request, pick the feature request template. And then it, as part of the, the summary or as a comment, um, tag one person, not me, please, because I don't want 48 issues to be in my inbox. Um, tag someone who you think should should know about this issue and, and might be um, might be a good person to, to pull into that discussion. So again, you can pick any of the repositories. Um, if it's analysis related, you might pick CDs. If it's geometry related, it's um, EPIC or it's uh, IP6. That's another repository which has the far forward, far backward detectors. Um, if it's related to reconstruction, um, it might be EIC recon. If you think this tutorial needs improvement, then you might even file an issue against the tutorial. Um, there's many different places. If you're doing Monte Carlo with eStarlight and you think eStarlight should do something different, you can file an issue there as well. So I'm going to give you about five minutes to do that because typing out the issue might, um, might require some thought. So.
So I want everyone to create an issue because it's going to be, there's going to be a next step where you then create a branch from that issue um, and then edit that branch back in EIC shell. So, uh, so there's going to be another step where this ties it back to EIC shell. So don't, you know, it, it will be useful to have that issue. <laughs> So Shinbai is asking how to ensure that you're using the latest version of the container. Uh, one way to do that is to type EIC info um, and just look at the last lines, which um, which include um, as as part of the the tag. No, oh, gotten a little bit of overlap here. Let me just click this away. There we go. Um, so you get things like jog XL, which is the the time when this last container was built. So in this case, it was built on September 2nd. Uh, so that's a way to check that you're indeed using the latest container. We probably could, could put this closer to the bottom, but uh, um, that indicates the, the time when the, the Jug XL container that you're in, Jug XL was, uh, was last built. So let's see if we have any new issues that have been submitted um, against the EPIC repository. That does not seem yet. Um, potentially some elsewhere. Not yet uh, against CDIC EIC either. Um, I just want to pick one that's been just submitted so I can uh, use it as an example. If anyone wants to Tell me where they've submitted an issue. <laughs> I can use that one. No one yet. Matt, do you have an issue? Yeah, I was going to say, Wooter, if you wanted to use the one I made with uh, changing the geometry. This one? Yeah, because I was just thinking I should probably create a branch for that. Okay, good. Um, we'll use that this one. This is exactly what I was looking into doing anyway. Okay, sounds good. I'll do that one then. Um, okay. Just a yeah. quick question. Should I do the branch on the main Epic repository, or should I continue to use my forked branch? Uh, forked repository um uh you can use the forked repository for now um I, i'm okay. gonna create the branch here just to demonstrate how it goes if that's okay yep 
Okay, so we're going to now go to the next step of, uh, of our workflow. So the first part is uh, file an issue so that there's visibility in what we think needs to get done. Um, in this case, Matt has self-assigned him to this, um, and it becomes, uh, um, becomes essentially his responsibility then, um, which means that no one else will start doing this work. Um, unless, of course, they want to check with Matt and say, you know, I, I will check before uh, before um, you do this. So the next step we're going to do here in this issue now is create a development branch from this. So there's under on the right side here, there's, you know, it's already clear that that Matt is assigned to this. Um, so normally this is this is what Matt would do, but but I'm going to do this now. I'm going to ignore projects and milestones, but I'm going to create a branch from this issue. And it's going to, by default, pick some some sensible name um, because Matt has used sensible characters in the title of his issue. Um, the only times when you would want to change this is when someone has used too many weird characters in the title of um, of, of the issue, and then it ends up being like dash 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 dash. Anyway, um, so I'm going to create this branch. I'm just going to use you know check out locally, and this will now have created this branch 76, which is the number of the issue, um, and then the description of the issue, or the, the title of the issue. I'm just gonna close this um, to show that there's there's now a branch here. That's where we're gonna do this development. I'm gonna click on this branch. It has changed here to the 76 outer MPGD layer geometry change as the, as the branch. Everything else in this branch is still the same as the main branch. If you're not logged in um, in, the, in the repository, uh, if you're not, sorry, if you're not a member of the EIC organization, then it probably will create a branch in a fork rather than inside the repository itself. But that, uh, um, we, we went over the, the reasons for that and, and the restrictions, um, and we'll, we'll talk about how that's, uh, how that's potentially um, limiting. So now you would want to change this branch and do actual work in that branch. So what we're going to do now is, is check out this branch in the repository inside EIC shell so we can actually um, run and compile this code. So I'm going to use the um, I'm going to use the SSH interface to to git because I will want to push changes to the code. Um, and uh, and that won't work with HTTPS. Um, so depending on how you have your Git interface set up, um, that might be a little bit different if you use the Git GitHub command line interface. But I'm going to use my SSH keys that are stored, and I'm going to go to my EIC directory. It can be any directory, of course, and I'm going to git clone that epic repository. So there it goes. Now I have epic under my lowercase EIC directory. And the epic directory contains everything that is oops, too far. That contains everything that's also inside the branch on GitHub. So this bin directory, calibrations compact, and so on. All of the geometry information for epic. Um, I can do my development here, um, but right now I'm still pointing to the main branch, not the branch that we actually are interested in here. So I'm going to get check out this 76 branch. And I need the full name. I copy that from there. So now I'm on the branch 76 outer MPGD layer geometry. Um, because I'm inside the container, I can, uh, I, and you could have done this outside the container too. You can use git outside the container, then go inside EIC shell, um, and then run your compilation inside EIC shell, and then go back outside of EIC shell. It doesn't really matter. Um, git is installed inside EIC shell anyway. Um, the the access to the SSH keys is anyway transferred. So so it really doesn't, doesn't matter all that much where you run it. Um, I can compile the code here, the geometry. And as you can see, it pulls, it finds all of the required dependencies like dd 4 hep and so on. Um, it finds them actually in those directories in, in opt software, not necessarily only in 
user local, although it does find some of them there. There are technical reasons why that's the case. I can compile all of this. I'm going to just, just build, well, I am not going to wait for this to complete um, with, with uh, a compilation because it's going to take a little while. Um, but I am going to make a small change in this branch just to indicate that um, you know we can we can then make changes in the branch um, and then submit them back to the repository. So, for example, in this case, let's say the change will be. Um, so let's see. Uh, um, we're going to go to the tracker directory, um, and I'm just going to edit the mpgd barrel and i'm going to do something very simple and and it's to add a comment at the top here this description of the barrel mpgd now also has um support uh or or not now also what is this supposed to do anyway <laughs> uh no also um allows you know then now has the right shape whatever we're gonna has the right shape okay and i'm going to oops save this i'm going to use my regular git workflow I'm going to git add mpgd barrel. I'm going to git commit mpgd barrel. I'm actually going to add the convenient flag that I typically do with git commit is minus v because it actually shows me the changes I just made. So I make, I'm sure I'm not committing accidentally too many things. Um, and I'm going to give this a title uh, updated comment field in info. Um, in XML info environment. And I'm going to push this back to the repository on GitHub. So now if I go to my um, GitHub page here and I actually refresh, it shows me that there have been changes in this branch. Um, so of course I would have I would have tested this a little bit more in EIC shell to be able to uh, uh, to be confident of this change, but that's going to be the topic of next week's um, uh, tutorial on on DD for HEP editing. So uh, so I'm not going to steal the thunder of whoever is giving the tutorial, maybe me um, next week. Uh, but uh, but that will be the topic of next week. So now we're just going to turn this into a pull request. So this is going to be now. The second step in our issue pull request workflow, where um, it took the title from this uh, this this commit I just made. Sometimes this will be blank, or it will be replaced by the the name of the branch. Um, so what does this PR introduce? Um, so this introduces um, a single comment in the top of the file. Um, does this, uh, what kind of change is this? Well, it's a bug fix, right? It's related to 76. Um, it's documentation update. That's also true. So this helps us in, in figuring out whether, um, what kind of change this is. Um, does this uh, fulfill anything about tests? No documentation. Well, there has been documentation added, but it's not really, yeah, let's, let's uh, do this. And um, we've communicated with the relevant collaborators, in this case, Matt. Are there any breaking changes? No. Does it change default behavior? No. And I will create my pull request. So in this case, you know, this is a fairly minor change, naturally. Um, I am going to request that Matt review this change. So he will get an email now asking to, uh, to give a sign off on that change. Um, every pull request that we merge into our mainline geometry um, has to be reviewed by at least by at least one person. Uh, there, th that includes um, 
that includes code that uh, that you know um, myself uh, and, and and other software developers who are conveners even are writing. Um, so we review each other's code because it it gives um, rise to to better code um, for everyone, not just not just people who are who are new to EIC. Um, so Matt will get an email to review this. He will go in and he'll say, "Yeah, I approve," or he'll request changes. Um, what is also happening is um, when this pull request is created, it actually starts a number of checks in um, on the the code. This is automatically run in on GitHub, and it's actually run inside EIC shell in the same environment. So you know that these checks, at least the ones that refer to EIC shell are run in exactly the same environment as um, the environment that you've developed in. So if, if something doesn't work here, if some error occurs, you actually should be able to reproduce that error exactly. Um, until, until Matt has reviewed this, um, and if he opens any kind of discussions, until all of this, these discussions have been marked as resolved by him, until all the checks have passed successfully, including some that run uh, on EIC web at, uh, at Argonne National Lab as a, as a separate system. Until then, this merging is blocked. So, and that ensures us that uh, whatever goes into the main development branch of the geometry and of any repository that has those perfections set up, um, that that works. And it, it doesn't just work, but it also passes all of our benchmarks. It doesn't introduce any overlaps and so on. Um, the, the only difference here is that this might look different for you because if you're not an administrator, you know, administrators can technically bypass that, but we don't bypass that. So um, let me go to these checks in a little bit more detail by scrolling up and going to the second tab here, uh, the third tab which shows all the checks that are being run. Um, I'm going to click on this EIC shell check. And this is where I need to zoom out with my browser because the number of checks, actually, as soon as, uh, as these jobs are a little further along, there's about 50 different checks and the list becomes too long to be on the, the screen. Um, so it's do doing things like building the geometry in um, in the cloud really now. Um, it's running an overlap check, various overlap checks. Um, it's comparing the the numbers that are in the geometry with the uh, menagerie detector parameter table. Um, it's converting the geometry to a number of different formats. Um, it's spinning off um, tests that are run on this EIC web server at BNL. And only after all of this comes back successfully is when we feel confident that we can um, accept this pull request. Now, of course, in this case, I know all of this is going to return successfully because the only change we made was a little comment. Um, although, you know, we've certainly made changes that we thought were not going to be much of an issue and then realized that they actually were um, once they go through the pipelines here. Um, so this should all come back successfully. Um, I hope Matt doesn't have any objections to uh, to the code, and then we would be able to um, to submit this pull request. So this sort of outlines the the workflow of filing an issue, and then turning that into a branch, and then doing a pull request from that branch, making sure all tests are successful, um, and then submitting those changes. Um, I can go through a couple of pull requests where, where actually these um, checks have brought out um, some some changes that we didn't uh, expect, and you know I, I don't want to like um, let me see if there's still one. Um, oh wait, it's under closed. Yeah, for example, um, without wanting to, to call anyone out, um, the, some, some minor changes that we thought were going to pass um, fine previously, um, just a couple of days ago, they actually did turn into a, a tiny, tiny overlap between different tracking volumes. Um, and this is one of those areas where these, these automatic checks actually caught that issue. 
um, before we merge things in um, and we were able to fix it. Um, so in this case, there is one of those overlap checks that actually um, caught this issue. Um, you can see the many different um, jobs that are being run. You know, there's so many of them that you can't actually read anymore what is there. Um, some of these are only populated after some of the previous jobs have run based on output from those previous jobs. It also produces output that um, you can you can look at if you want to, um, including here a CSV file of the detector parameter table um, that you can compare one to one with what's on the, the menagerie. Um, and then I think uh, Shayam asked about this yesterday, but also a root file, which by now it, it should be renamed to Epic, um, a root file that you can use as input to, uh, to root to just look at uh, the geometry. Okay, um, so um, we can turn this into an exercise, but it depends a little bit on whether um, you think you would be the one to um, implement the work on the issue that you've submitted. If you think that you will be the one to do that, then I would encourage you to create a branch um, based on the issue you've submitted and then, um, and then uh, see if you can check this out in EIC shell and make some changes, commit it back to the repository and turn it into a pull request. Um, the advantage of this approach is also that it will be immediately clear that you are working on something. And there certainly is any, isn't any, um, any shame in submitting half work to that pull request as you're continuing to work on it, because it's much better to get someone to look at it uh, as a reviewer, for example, if you invite them um, before you put in all the work than after all the work is already done. So, uh, so that might be a useful thing to do. Um, other than that, if you uh, if you are not the one who is going to resolve the issue that you've uh, filed earlier, then um, then you could uh, go through this workflow now by just creating a branch or or by by making some other small changes um, and uh, and seeing if you can submit um, a, a pull request as well. So so that's the last part of our um, of our tutorial for today. Um, closing out kind of the, the GitHub um, part of the productivity environment. There's some parts I haven't shown that you might find useful as well. Um, it includes, for example, project tracking boards. I'm going to pick the one for the DRich simulations because they're right up front here. Um, so there are some to-do lists, in-progress lists, done lists. Uh, did I drag that around? No, okay. Um, so there's different interfaces that people use to look at these project boards, I think the reconstruction um, uses sort of this, this columnar system. So that's one of the approaches that people use to be to work together as well. And you see the, the different you know icons for the different people assigned to each of those um, each of those components. Uh, in addition to projects, there are discussion pages. Again, all of this from the the homepage of um, the, the EIC organization on GitHub, where you can ask questions, for example, you know, how would we deal with G4 or SIPM integration in our simulations? Um, and then there's some discussion that starts and some communication that people have about that. Um, you know, FAQs, what, what does it mean? What's, what's inside MC particles in the output? root files, so this might be relevant for, for future analysis tutorials. This, these are at this point more um, analysis um, outputs. Um, so those are all different aspects of our collaborative productivity environment on GitHub that you might be interested in exploring as well. And that's it for today. So um, we have uh, another half hour, I think, in the, um, in the time that was allocated, which is uh, a time that yesterday we filled with some questions. Um, so uh, so if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, can you please tell me how to, I'm uh, getting some error in creating a geometry root file using GD. Can you put some hint? What is the epic for the epic? 
Um, so if you have a, a specific um, error, can, can you post that on the help desk in Mattermost so then we can help you there? Because it's difficult to, to, to okay, help okay, in the okay, abstract okay. Via, via Zoom, so. Okay, I will post it. Okay. okay. Or as an issue, if you want to file an issue against a specific repository, but I think this might be um, something where we can help on Mattermost as well. Any other questions? Yeah, like I have one. Mm -hmm. Like on the, uh, in the first part, I was able to create the environment successfully, but like uh, after that, I wasn't able to do anything. Like it says it does not recognize like uh, when I put the command that dot slash EI shell, it says dot is not recognized as an internal or external command. Like, am I missing any, like any software over here? Um, no, did you um, put dot slash EIC shell without a space after the dot? Could that be it? Cause it sounds it's interpreting the dot as a separate command, so. Like there has to be space or not? No space. Yeah, there, there is no space. Okay. Um, so so can you copy and paste uh, what you're seeing into the, the help desk channel on um, on EIC, uh, on, on, on uh, Mattermost? Um, then we can see it uh, and, and help, you, uh, help you out there. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so one of the the, the things that is often helpful is to be able to, of course, see the, the output of any commands that um, you think are not doing the right thing. Um, so just in general, not just this particular issue, but uh, um, being able, uh, this is part of the being able to reproduce things um, in the same environment. Uh, if, if we see exactly what you typed, then we can also try to reproduce exactly what you are, uh, what you are seeing. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ruth Parna. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not able to join the GitHub uh, EIC project. So uh, actually, I have already my account uh, since I'm working in Alice. Mm -hmm. so, so what can I do? Can I? So this is the, the GitHub um, organization, the EIC organization? Yes. So to join, just send your GitHub username to uh, um, to either the. Um, so let me go back here to the, the page that you probably see. Um, oh, public here. Um, so either send it by email to the EIC user group, software working group conveners, or post it um, on Mattermost. Just send it to me, and I can make sure you get added. Um, it, there's no there's no way in which you can yourself request to be added. So. Okay, so uh, is it possible? Like, uh, I would like to uh, give my name in the mind matter most so that mm -hmm. I can be added. Yep, Thank you. That's, that will work. Uh, yes, I have additional question. So do mm -hmm. I, uh, for this purpose, so uh, can I just use my uh, username uh, in the matter most uh, so that with the username you can add me? Yep. Yeah, my yeah, username is fine. Username or email is fine. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So I saw Shyam, you, you posted something in the in the chat. So you're in currently in a directory where um, you're not allowed to write. So it can't write the file there. So so you'll have to navigate to a directory where you're not where where you are able to write. Okay, okay. Then it's working basically. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. The problem is the so you have to I have to go create my own local directory, yes, somewhere or some directory don't have the permission to create the file. Oh, yes, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, I am going to stop the recording in case there's some people who want to ask questions after that.